Hello, everyone, and welcome to Rocket Lasso Live. I am your host, Chris Schmidt, and we're going to be answering questions about Cinema 4D live from the chat. I've got a chat from a live stream on YouTube and from Twitch, and we'll be alternating between those, trying to figure things out as we go. We never know what we're going to hit. We've already got questions coming in. We've got lots of people hanging out. So let's just uh, jump on into cinema and begin learning and figuring things out. Uh, as a quick preview, this is a thumbnail for an upcoming tutorial from a week from now, I think. So if you want to get access to this early, you can jump on the Patreon. But otherwise, it's just something I had open already. Figured I'd mention it. All right. Questions, questions. I'll start with Twitch this time. Shane, um, Rhombic Do... Doda... Do, oh, I'm assuming that's Dodecahedron at the end of this video. That's 47.33. Let's see what we've got here. All right, we got an advertisement first. Skip. All right. Oh, it's an Adam Savage video. Very nice. How recent is this? Oh, very recent. I haven't seen this one yet. Um, I've, I've watched pretty much all of the tested videos. They're really nice. Oh, I see a shape coming together here. So you said about 43 or 47, 33, 47... 33. By the way, you can copy and paste time codes from YouTube, so um, that is helpful. All right, they're probably about to activate. Ooh, okay, it's a mirror box. That's what you're, it's a mirror box idea. Uh, now, this is only we, uh, in 3D. Where does it go in all? Oh, okay, it does spin in all directions, so very cool. Uh, yeah, it's a mirror box. I've actually tinkered with this type of thing before, and it's totally doable. So, yeah, let's try and make one. Uh, up, 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 click here. Okay, here we are in Cinema S22. In fact, there was just an update that they came out with. I haven't gotten to check all of the fixes, but hopefully things are working a little bit better. Um, so mirror box. Now we can actually make this out of any shape that we like. I mean, that was a, a dodecahedron, it seems like, but we can make it out of anything. Let's make a weirder shape. I'm gonna make, well, I don't know. Keeping it relatively simple is a good idea. I'm gonna decide to start out with an icosahedron, but you could, you know, I think right there is a dodecahedron um, make this editable and actually, I mean, a lot of this is probably going to be pretty straightforward. How, how do we want to do this? I'm going to do an inner extrude without preserving groups. So we can shrink that in. So we get individual polygons. Well, having these edges is nice. I might actually keep it parametric. The, uh, the main thing being we want to see through one side and have reflections on the rest of it. But can we see through the box? Now that I think about it, have I ever been outside of the box to see it? I don't know. I don't know, especially if we're in physical. And um, I don't currently have any third-party renderers actively installed in this particular version of cinema. So we'll have to deal with that in a little bit. Uh, so I guess we'll go old school physical on this one. Um, I'm going to, we don't need color, but we're going to need lots of reflection. So remove the base layer and add a TGX. It should be fully reflective. Get rid of the roughness, get rid of the specular. So it's a super shiny, you know, 100% mirror. And then we can also turn on transparency. So that should become glass. Now this technically should have some thickness to it. So let's do that. Uh, pretty straightforward to do, making a Mm, let's make a generator cloth surface, drop that in. I mean, I, I know why they call it the cloth surface, but at this point we use this to create thickness on objects way more than we ever use it to create cloth. It's kind of funny. All right, we'll add a little bit of thickness to that so it becomes more like glass. That will become the geometry. And I'm not sure how well, honestly, some of this is going to work. So let's just uh, keep on exploring and end up seeing. I'm gonna create a cube, T for scale and scale it way down. Create a cloner inside that, put the cube, clone that onto an object. The object will be our platonic. It shall be cloning onto the edge of the object and it'll scale on the edge to 100%. And now you get this cube on all the edges. We can hit T for scale and scale it down to whatever size we want. And it's nice and clean. We can pull off the edges later, but let's not worry about that quite yet. So. I'm going to find a fine little start there. A basic way of beginning 
is let's create a luminance material. Luminance. I'll make it pure luminance right now and drop it onto those. And I'm not sure what we're going to end up with here. So I'm going to Alt-R and let this render. And immediately we can see that it is reflecting on the inside. So let's put this into a dark environment by turning off um, turning off the default light. Control-B will pop open our render settings. Inside of there, under Options, you see that we have a default light turned on. Turn that off. So there should be no automatic light in the scene. We just have this one. And hmm, here's where things get tricky because we are outside the box looking in, but reflections are... Um, reflections are a little bit trickier because I think when I have done these tests, now that I think about it, it's kind of this one-way glass. I'm not even sure if that's possible to do in cinema. I mean, you can see that we are seeing through it and it is doing that reflection, but it's it's not a one-way mirror. Um, maybe we can fake it by putting a reflective material on one side and not the other is a thought. Um, but the, what I've typically done in the past would be, let's not, well, just to show you, if we make this not transparent and we go inside of it, so now we're inside, if we were to render that, you're going to suddenly see all these crazy patterns. And this is because it is reflecting again and again and again and again. This might be a little clearer if we make it not reflect quite all the way. Let's do a 90%. So each one should be a little dimmer and we can push it down even more. Each one will be a little dimmer than the previous one. 75. Each one will be dimmer than the previous ones. You can see the base one and the reflection, a reflection of a reflection, a reflection of a reflection of a reflection. And what's cool about this is you can uh, increase the number of them because right now we have a reflection depth of, of five, but jump that to 10 and we'll have twice as many. And you see how much further it extends and jump that up to 20 to double it again. And you'll see how much more complexity comes every single time. And uh, you know, at a certain point, we're going to get diminishing returns, but now we're at 50 units and it's reflecting a lot of, actually it might be clamped at 50 as well because that's a ray depth. No, about the same. So you can see how it goes deeper and deeper and deeper, which is a super cool effect. I mean, just look at this crazy structure that we get from the inside. I'm going to zoom out more so you see I'm getting more of a fisheye view. And we'll just see a little bit more of the overall pattern. It's really neat. It's fun to play around with. There's a lot of different structures we could feed in and outlines there's just a i mean it's neat the problem right now comes in that i don't know that it's possible in vanilla cinema to do the one-way mirror because from the outside that's not going to look like anything we have to turn the transparency back on again to see through it but once we see through it you're going to see that we get kind of one layer of reflection but it becomes very based off of the oh and there's refraction i'm going to turn off the refraction that should maybe add some clarity Mm, maybe actually without refraction everything just uh, becomes really solid so i don't know that that's possible so here's the thought what if we make something that is reflective and we'll make it on one side of the material that will be a reflection and let's make a fully transparent material and i, I don't know if this will work or not but uh, I guess we'll just make the transparency there and put it back to the glass reflectance. And currently we're adding thickness on here, but the mm, tricky, tricky. How would I do this? Because really that should just be the glass and we're seeing through the glass. And then potentially we can have a secondary layer on the inside. I'm gonna grab the entire bit of geometry and shrink it in. And if I make that reflective, so there's kind of one on the inside. It's not gonna look like much right now, but you see there's actually like a, a mirror inside of this glass. Can we make it so that that becomes one-sided? That is the question. Um, I'm actually gonna do it with transparency. Alphas and transparencies combine oddly. So under transparency, I'm going to attempt to add a normal direction. Here we go. Normal direction. So this should only see through one side and not the other. The preview looks promising, but I don't know what we'll get. Um, okay, so not great right there, but we might need to invert it. 
but not too promising yet. So I'm going to invert it by dragging one color up and the other one down. And now hopefully we can see through. Nope, didn't that still didn't apply. That is the material in there. So it's not working with transparency. Let's try with alpha. So the exact same idea. Put in normal direction with the alpha. Run it. No change. Invert. Sadly, no change. Hmm. I could try inverting the normals you are. I don't think that's going to do anything. I can even hit, I can hit T for scale and scale those down a little bit more. That is also not working. And invert that. I'm not sure if, that, does anybody have an idea? Something I'm missing to make that one way? Um, yeah, the normal should do it, but Shane, it's worth giving that a try. Uh, we will do a front and back material. There's always a chance that works. So in this reflective one, we'll just make pure reflection and I'll make a duplicate of that. No reflection, but this one can have clear out the transparency. So it's just pure transparency. And let's apply this material to the front and this material to the back. Doesn't seem to work. I'm going to in reverse the direction of these or, you know, the order still no. And then I will try flipping those again back. Wait, uh, back. Yeah. Front to back. Try again. Doesn't work. Try again. Sadly, doesn't work. It could just be a limitation in physical that we can't do it. Um, yeah, it also there might be a bit of a technique that I don't. Okay, there's a lot of people uh, saying different ideas. Um, uh, uh, somebody saying increase the bounces. It's already cranked up to 50. So this is not the problem um, that we're running into there. Um, and then, yep, yeah, so a lot of these, well, I already said that, well, I got to remember, sometimes I got to ignore the chat because I already said I don't have any third-party renderers, so I can't try Redshift. None of them are currently installed. The uh, And then there's a lot of people saying, like, add material option. Like, you know, th these, these, there's a lot of combinations, but I don't know that we can trust, or it just goes to yeah, a lot of suggestions, but who knows which thing could work. So I appreciate the help, everyone, but I don't think... Yeah, that's not, uh, none of these are going to quite do it for us, sadly. Um, now, even having said that, it's a little sad that that doesn't quite work, but it is really fun to play with a pure reflection and travel inside of it. And you do still get, uh, delete that one. We can travel inside of it and still get our kind of infinity mirror, but from the inside. Third party render, this might just automatically work, but. I think we've kind of run into a limitation here. I definitely recommend playing around with these, though, on the interior, the different effects that you can do. And rotating the camera inside here, it's just really fun. You never quite know what you're going to end up with. I will save this. If you support on Patreon, you get access to all of these scene files. Just an FYI. Uh, this will be our first project of the day. Uh, too bad we were not able to push it further. And I would like to explore that more. It's just not something I'm an expert on. So uh, I'm going to jump into uh, YouTube and see if there's any questions that are popping up. Yeah, Delaney, I, I agree. I'm not so sure about physical. Somebody's saying that uh, Redshift does work, but Octane doesn't. So it seems to be very particular on different renderers. It's too bad my my uh, I have to just update my Redshift license, so I don't currently have it. Mm. Yeah, there's a lot. Well, I, I'm trying not to fake it. There's a lot of people being like, "Oh, like delete the polygon in the front so we can see through it." Yes, those are technically things we could do, but uh, I wanted to make it more real. And as far as doing it for real, I don't think it's quite working for us. The uh, I didn't think. Also, there's like a, a I didn't see anybody say it, but I think compositing tags could have. Yeah, crossfader. No, I, I, everybody seems to doubt that I didn't crank up reflection depth, but there it is. There's the reflections. We did it. Um, 
But yeah, uh, look, we're moving on. We're moving on to new questions. I appreciate the uh, the extra enthusiasm there, but without third party renderer, I don't think it's going anywhere. Um, maybe here. Yeah. Okay. I'm 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 done reading suggestions on that one. But I appreciate the uh, the effort, everyone. Um, Mick, what do you got? How do you go about creating this lettuce? style opening at the bottom left all right color me intrigued let's make sure okay Bing. uh okay this is from official houdini and it's doing lots of crazy things and yeah, okay there's this leafy this leafy esque growth down there um Hmm. Um, it some of it depends on what your goal is. I'm going to open up a new file. I mean, the obvious thing to say here is use soft bodies and we can grow the soft bodies, but of course those are not, uh, I mean, it's, it's, you know, really powerful, but that's throwing a lot of stuff, scaling it up. It wouldn't be very controllable. Uh, having said that, I wonder if there are, if we could just play around with a helix and make something that is more parametric for instance if we create this helix grab the start radius and drop it down to zero we get this nice spiral and i'm going to cut this to two it's only going to spin around 360 so you get something like that creating a loft here we can feed in the helix and that's not going to look like much in the beginning because there's nothing for it to latch onto. But if we put two helixes in and I hit R and I start spinning one of them, you can see that we're going to create some geometry spinning around on it. Now, if the second helix has, uh, let's zero out its secondary radius, you can see we get the center point and that will twirl around the outside. It could also have some radius and we could spin it more or less. So there's a lot of potentially interesting combinations we get as these twirl around and go end up matching each other but um i know the geometry is not looking amazing here i'm trying to think i guess maybe shrinking the radius down and then making it not quite so tall yeah there okay that's now closer to what what we were sort of looking at so you can see that we've got all these layers traveling through the entire structure and uh the uv mapping on this should be really nice so we have a lot of options as far as creating exactly how many segments around that we want to travel. We get this nice spiral with lots of control. We can, you know, the way that's kind of growing, you see how that effect looks a lot like this. So keep that in mind. And then as far as creating that displacement, I think that we probably have a lot of power here by, let's create a displacer. And I'll just group this, Alt-G, group that, put in the displacer. And I think it'd be nice to see it on the material to get a preview. So temporarily, I shall put it in the luminance channel inside there. We can put a, let's start with a gradient and see which way it's spiraling. You see by default, it's spiraling around and up. So we actually want to change this to V. And now it's traveling from the center out. So we can have an effect to get stronger towards the edge ver versus the middle. And then let's throw that into a layer shader. Inside the layer shader, we can also create a noise. In this particular case, the way we're spiraling around, I think it would be a good idea to convert this noise into a two-dimensional noise. Currently, the space is based on texture, but setting that down to 2D, it is now a 2D texture. Now, yeah, all of this uh, high-quality noises, please. And some SSAO won't hurt. Hopefully, that's showing. Actually, let's render and make sure that, hey, that's the luminance channel. Why is it? Uh... Oh, okay, it is there. And how accurate is that? It seems, okay, it's spot on as far as accuracy. So this is now, when you put this texture onto space 2D, you can think of it like a JPEG. It, we're, it's like we're bringing in an image. It's just, that is what we see and that is what we get. So scaling on X, probably, as I change this number, hopefully, okay, it does update in the viewport. That is stretching it. So I want to shrink it, drop this down to 25 perhaps. And I can see it's going to start getting longer there. And then we have Y. I'm going to make it 10 times taller on Y. And it's going to start stretching it very vertically. You see that these lines will start getting stretched upward. And I think that's an okay pattern. That can, let's put the gradient above it and multiply it. 
So it gets darker as it goes down. And based on that, our displacer can view as its reference in the shading tab. It'll view the luminance channel of, of that material. We need plenty of geometry to be able to subdivide. So I'm going to crank this way up and we'll even give ourselves a couple extra vertical segments. So now uh, th this material is being seen, but you see it's, it doesn't look so good in our viewport. So I can actually make this not show up by typing in a selection that we don't currently have. So, you know, we can type in anything like an exclamation mark or whatever, and that material actually will not apply, but the displacer still sees it. So you can see we're getting this nice displacing happening right in the viewport. Currently it's intensity centered. I'm going to say just intensity. That will push it in the correct direction or the right amount of power. So I can increase this up to whatever amount is not going to make it explode. Something like that's pretty nice. Yeah, that's looking pretty good. And all of this being parametric, we have the ability to spin these and create whatever radius or rotation that we want. It could be spun more or less. We can offset this actually. That's a little, it's a little twitchy there, probably as it's bumping into these other points. Oh yeah, that, uh, that is a little twitchy. I'm not sure what to make of that actually. Um, I'm sure th there's a logic to it. It's got nothing to do with the displacer that has everything to do with the loft interpreting it. And it's, actually, no, it does seem to be the displacer. It seems to be maybe flipping from one side to the other. That might make sense. So, well, just looking at the base object, I can pull this up and down and we can dramatically change the shape that we're feeding through. The scale of this is very important for the overall pattern. That could be very small. Okay, not zero, apparently. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. A little bit of space is good. But those can spiral up, give it more space. It just gives a lot of control. Displacing creates this really cool looking spiral and it's all parametric. We have control over this in a way that we wouldn't with soft bodies, which is, I think, always an advantage to build a rig whenever we can. I love dynamics. Don't get me wrong. Dynamics is my jam. But the, the idea of having a rig that we can just in real time do this and not being not worrying about soft bodies is just really kind of an important extra detail that we can uh, build a rig. And I really think, especially with the addition of fields, even though this one isn't currently showing it, the addition of fields does a really good job of uh, enabling us to create more rigs. Um, one thought here is, actually, this could be neat. I don't know if this is a good idea, but if we created a cloner and dropped both of these splines inside of it, I can set this to linear with no spacing. And there are currently three clones, so there's three. If I set this to blend, then it should morph between these three types of splines, giving us a midpoint spline that's halfway between the settings of the other two. Now, I do think that I shouldn't have did the, which that's, this is the one that's doing a little bit of a spiral by pasting that same number in here. That should calm that down a little bit. There we go. That is what I wanted. Now we can make more clones. That's gonna create more Oops, get rid of the verticalness. As I create more clones, there's more in-between steps. It's actually this little transition between them. But even just by creating this third one, it's kind of a neat way of getting three splines. If I make this cloner editable, you'll see I have three splines now. And this middle one is the halfway point between these, the other two. And by feeding in, potentially, by feeding in these three splines, it's going to transition between all three states. And might be a good idea subdivide but by changing the placement of this and the height of it and the biases of it we can kind of change this midpoint into some additional shapes and these you know it's looking it's pretty nice pretty neat shape there and you know every every, every little setting we change is going to have an effect on the way that that transitions as well the uh, keep in mind that the displacer is seeing this as the base shape so we are getting kind of this a little bit rougher of a line right there, but keep in mind, that's not the displacer causing it. It's the geometry geometry we are initially feeding in. Um, something I might do would be to drop our subdivisions quite a bit. We don't, you know, if we don't have, you know, keep this light on the subdivisions and then throw the entire thing into a subdivision surface. And now you see we'll get a smoother transition between them. And then that's what gets displaced, which will end up with pretty much the same end result. As long as we have enough subdivisions. Geometry is not quite as nice on that one. I guess it's not subdivided as many times vertically, but yeah, different methods of the of a very similar layout. And the settings inside of here, as far as like organic form, well, I guess that's not changing it. Loop is going to look really weird. But yeah, I just wanted to show you a slight extra complication on that, creating an extra helix 
to do the transition between them. And I think that pretty much covers what I wanted to say about this one. We'd probably want to keyframe down the thickness of the displacer as it shrinks to these tinier sizes, but yeah, a couple keyframes on that and you could get some really fun growth on top of everything. And I didn't do it, but inside the noise, uh, I think we could probably animate this noise. I mean, animation speed of one and hit play. And yeah, those will be waving around and transitioning. It looks like cloth as well. So kind of neat along those lines. I wish that there was uh, settings inside of here. I guess it's just based on the way it's mapped, but I wish there were settings inside of here for us to offset on X and Y so it could animate vertically or horizontally. Once you put in 2D, that goes away. But if you have these other modes, you actually do get your movement X, Y, and Z, but it's not two-dimensional anymore. And you see immediately that gets messed up. That's why you have to make it 2D. So extra details on there. And we'll give this one a save and we'll jump to another question. Leafy growth spiral. Hmm. Uh, Abraham, I don't know what you mean. It's at the highest possible quality I have. So I'm guessing it's your internet, not the stream quality. No one else is saying that the quality is down. Some of the questions on YouTube are a little complex. Um, well, I'm I haven't dropped any frames. Is any is the quality down for anybody? Uh, one person is saying that seems to. No, everybody else is saying it's good. So I think it's on your end. Um, let's see. Yeah, the questions on YouTube are a little crazy. Um, yeah, a kinetic sand effect. Uh, well, there's people who are trying to post. It seems like you're trying to post links. You cannot post links in YouTube. You have to go onto Twitch and post them. Okay, but uh, so uh, I'm going to look at Twitch. Uh, three people came immediately with questions. Mm -hmm. uh, purple mattress reference we talked about the other day. Uh, Travis, I'm down for that, but you got to find the link. Yeah, that was a neat question, but we need to. I need to see the reference. I don't have it handy. So if we don't see it, we can't make it. Um, how would you make a dynamic break like a bullet hole through wood or stone? Hmm. It's a fine... It's a fine question. Um, how would I make a bullet hole? We don't have a specific reference here, so why don't we... I'm going to open up YouTube and do a search. I have any other window right now, just so I can skip any ads that pop up. Um, bullet wood. Uh, I don't even know what to search for. It's going to be hard to find reference here. It's just a random video. One wheels. Do, 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 do. This is uh, Edwin. And it looks like he's going to be shooting. It doesn't look like he's doing slow-mo stuff, so it's going to be... Yeah, there's almost nothing to see there. The, the wooden... Shooting wood is actually pretty boring, at least according to uh, to this. Uh, glass, bullet, shatter. Bunch of CG tutorials we're looking for. I mean, a lot of this is bulletproof glass, not shattering. Yeah, I mean, well, just to throw it out there, uh, this is the kind of instance where it'd be good to get a reference. If there's a very specific effect that you're looking for, I want to see like the photographic reference so we can aim for that. Uh, without having good photographic reference, I'm going to do the generic version and just create a thin sheet of glass. It's not too thin. It's at five. Of course, a Veronoi 
fracture is going to be the way to get our base shattering. We can create as many random ones as we want to by increasing that. And then I tend to like to add a lot more detail near the point of impact. So in this case, something that could be nice is creating a matrix object, linear zero for its Y height. So we can make as many of these as we want. Let's make 100. And then I can create a random effector and scatter them randomly in all directions. It's just a nice distribution. Get rid of Z and I can see we get this pattern. By the way, here's a neat thing. It's kind of uh, outside of this, but what ends up happening is if we give this a randomness, well, I'll turn it off. Let me just talk about this principle for a moment. You can see that I've got 100 clones all exactly on top of each other. If we make this with a grid, uh, yeah, if this was a grid, of course, we're getting a square pattern. But what if you want a round pattern? Well, you could change the form to be a sphere or a cylinder, although everything suddenly disappeared, and I'm not entirely sure why. Probably because it needed more height to be able to see any of them, yeah. So even that's being a little bit weird. So probably cylinder. Yeah, that, that does a fine job. We could do a pattern like that, not a little randomness. But let's say that we had this linear one, and we want to create a randomness and if i create the random it's going to create a square pattern it's traveling up a certain amount left a certain amount and eventually that's a square as i increase the count you can see it's a very square pattern but if we didn't want it to be square what if we want to be round what we can do is treat this in two steps so with just the matrix i can create a cloner random and this is going to offset in all directions I don't want it in all directions. I only want it, let's say, on Y. No, no, I'm not even going to spin. Let's turn off position and turn on rotation. So I want these to spin on the proper orientation. So let's try that one. Nope, third time is the charm. So I'm going to spin on this one. You can see how they're spiraling. So kind of they're all random in on the Z axis. So let's make sure that those can randomly spin up to 360. Currently, this is going to be both positive and negative. So that, that's fine. And then we select the matrix and add a second effector. This time, well, I guess it can be a random effector again. So create a random effector. And that's just randomly pushing everything out again. But instead of it pushing out randomly in all directions, I'm not even sure which one we need. Maybe Y. Yeah, there we go. Now you can see as I increase this, it is relative to what came before. So they all randomly got rotated. And now this is randomly pushing them outward. Now keep in mind, this is actually pushing outward down and outward up. So if you all wanted them purely out, you can put it to zero. So now they're just increasing in power and spiraling out. So you can see how we can use this to get a spiral sort of explosion out in all directions. And, um, and then what's cool about this technique also is there's actually more in the middle than that. And then, <clears throat> than the outside, because it's kind of like if you took any square area, it, it just, yeah, this is a larger space. So there's less in them. So this gives us this nice random spiral. And our distribution, we should be able to get control over our, actually there is no mapping here. So I was gonna say we get some distribution going, but maybe not. I'm trying to think if there's an easy way to do that. It's not super important for this, uh, but let's go back to our glass shattering. So now I've got this more spiraled out pattern. Feed that in as a additional source. And now that should break some more. I'm gonna hide the matrix and you can see how we have more of a spiral pattern. We can turn off the original one if we wanted to. Actually, yeah, we can turn that off and get more detail in and they get larger as they go out. Those other settings, I just thought it'd be cool to explore the uh, the ability to spiral out a matrix object like that. In addition, I shall, uh, we're gonna shoot it with a bullet. I'll keep it as simple as possible. I'll make a capsule shape, pretty small, but not too small. I want it to be able to react properly. So that can shoot through make this a dynamic object simulation rigid body and in order for it to calculate really really accurately i'm going to change the shape from automatic to ellipse ellipsoid so it's trying to map a sphere on here as accurately as it can it should do a fine job for our purposes in addition to that we want this to fly forward with a quite a bit of speed but we got to be careful there because it's kind of a a push and pull i'm going to turn on custom initial velocity and we have x y X, Y, Z, we want to go forward on Y. I'm not sure how fast, so I'm going to say one, one, one. Hit play, and yeah, that's actually a pretty good speed. Boo! Now, this is going to be affected by gravity. Um, in general, I mean, especially if we're building like some sort of slow motion, if it's happening in real life, I would probably just do it with particles because, or if it was happening at 
real time speed. It'd be so fast you wouldn't see it, and you could just get the shattered parts to fall. I'm assuming we we're doing this in a pseudo slow motion fashion. If in which case this bullet wouldn't really have too much bullet drop, we could sort of ignore that. So what I could do is turn off all gravity, control or command D, dynamics, no gravity. And now that won't fall, obviously. It'll just keep shooting forward. But now when the glass shatters, that will need gravity. Let's give this, well, let's make the fracture be dynamic. Simulation, rigid body. Create a floor to catch some pieces. We'll move that down. Make it dynamic as well. And this is going to instantly shatter, but there's no gravity or anything. So it's probably just going to sit there. In fact, let's turn off the bullet just for a moment. Hit play, and you can see it's just going to sit there. It's not going to do anything. Actually, it's not entirely true. Do you see these pieces start drifting apart from each other a little bit, very slowly? Why are they doing that? Well, they are doing that because each of them has a margin. Each of them has almost like a little invisible force field around it that is trying to make the, the, the calculations a little more accurate. And we can see this if we go to Control D again, Dynamic Settings. And under expert, you see there's a collision margin of one. So a little invisible force field is intersecting between all of our different objects and thus making them push apart from each other a little bit. If we drop that to zero and we hit play, then hopefully, yep, when I hit play, you see none of these are now moving. They are not bumping into anything because of the initial state. So with this lack of gravity, this now can be stable and not look like it's shattering away and actually working quite nicely. So now if we turn that on, this can fly through and boom, just create the shatter and that will propagate through the rest of it. Now, assuming we want gravity to take over and let these fall, uh, we're gonna need a force of some sort. I'm going to create just a wind. We could use a, yeah, let's use a field force, why not? So here's a field force. I want it to apply just to the fracture. So inside of its dynamics tag under forces, I'm gonna say include the field force and the bullet, I'm gonna say include nothing. So it's just, it's ignoring all forces. This field force should have a strength of 40, which is the same as gravity. And now we need a direction. So I'll create a solid and currently it's pushing upward. So if I just hit play, I think everything will fly up. So we want it to go down. So let's set negative Y, X, Y, Z. So I'm saying there, your direction is down. Your power is one times strength of 40, which is exactly cinema gravity. And now those should fall down just like gravity. The bullet's not affected, but these are. So that all begins to fall instantly. But of course, this, uh, everything's falling right away. It's not shattered. So what's a, what's maybe a way, I'm gonna turn off this uh, display. I don't, it, the direction is just down. Uh, what's a way of making only certain pieces get affected? Well, um, it's going to be a little bit tricky because these other ones are not going to get left behind technically. Um, but maybe maybe there's things we can do. I'm thinking that we need a MoGraph selection tag. Let's add a MoGraph. I think we can do a selection tag. We can also do a weight map. I'll do a weight map. It'll make it a little more visual. Now you see we get these nice little dots on everything. The best part of this tool is we can turn on use fields and we can now use fields to control this. The obvious thing is to drop this bullet in. I think it'll be a little more accurate if I add in some sort of fall off. In fact, I'll make a capsule shape and make that a child of the capsule. Reset PSR. It's going to become a child of that. Set this to Z plus T for scale, scale it down, just match our object. So it should be incredibly accurate. And then uh, we'll give it full power. So remapping, no fall off. So full power all the way. So that should be able to hit this. And as it hits it, those will become activated. Now uh, it's going to be a little hard to see there. So actually I'm going to make this not dynamic for a little bit. I'm going to take off the dynamics tag. We should still be able to see this hit play. And you're going to see it flashed yellow right there as it was intersecting it. So we actually wanted to remember those pretty straightforward, create a decay with a maximum. So now as the bullet passes through, those turn yellow and they stay yellow. Now, I think we want this to grow. So we probably don't even need the decay if we're using growth. So I'll turn that off, add in a freeze, set the freeze to add to what's below it. It is going to grow the current radius. I'm not sure how far away these dots are. So I'm going to make a cube, T for scale, scale it down. And it seems like around there, like it looks like about five units. 
is about the small distance, but you know, I always like making it a little bit larger. I just wanted in my head to have a good relative scale. I'm gonna make the radius 20, which is quite a bit larger, but the effect strength will be quite weak. Let's say 10. So and I'm also gonna hit clear because usually it remembers some initial states. So let's see if this works at all. The hope here is as it hits, this is gonna slowly grow outwards. That's actually working quite well. Now, I guess when it comes to, well, that could still work. It, we, we're, probably, we're probably gonna increase our effect strength, but let's just leave that as it is for now. Mm, okay, cool. Now I want to make this dynamic again. So here's our dynamic tag, but we can feed in a MoGraph selection. Now, actually, I don't think, yeah, this actually does not accept a MoGraph weight map. So maybe we shouldn't have done it with a weight map, but that's fine. I'm going to add a MoGraph selection tag instead. We'll have that calculate after. I don't think that actually matters too much. But inside of there, we can actually feed it its own fields. So inside of its own field, we can drag that nice weight map we made. And here is a threshold that's looking at. So this should be a selection tag that is, you see there, it's a little hard to see because of tiny little brown dots. But as it goes through, um, I'm going to turn off dynamics again. As it passes through, the other thing should be growing and our selections are growing as well. And now those actually turn on or off. So it's kind of the difference between these is this is a weight. So zero between zero and one, but this is a toggle. It's a bool. It's true or false. So these are growing and they are true or they are false. And then that can grow. So that's fine. We fed one into the other. Now we can put in our dynamic tag and drag in our MoGraph selection tag under dynamic. So now they are only turned on if they're fed a dot that's on. So when I, we first hit, actually, we'll just turn off the capsule for a moment. When I hit play, it's not falling. Nothing is happening. And that's because nothing is currently dynamic. So I'll turn that on. <laughs> Bunk. Actually, this, uh, this might be something we do need to worry about. They, uh, it's bouncing off the wall because it's not... <laughs> It's not dynamic yet, so it just bounces off of it, which is pretty funny. Um, so what can we do? Maybe we can put it into not be enabled. Okay, yeah, there we go. Put it into it's not enabled yet. So it's always on, but it's not enabled. There's a big difference between those two, apparently. So now you can see that my bullet will travel through pretty much you know, unaffected. And then as it spreads out, they are turning on their dynamicness and then the gravity will take over from there. So it's kind of a fun additional growth on that. Now, like I said, the growth is pretty slow. Let's double the speed. And eventually our radius is not big enough to get to everything. That's kind of by design. We could shrink this to 15 and that won't spread as far now. You see it's good. Well, yeah, you see more pieces are left behind. So depending on the way you want that to work, it could be it, 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 you know, it just depends on the way you want that to work. So these pieces are, are triggering and then falling. Now, the next possible layer to this is like, this is fine. I'm, in fact, I'm going to save it because it's, it's a, com a completely serviceable rig. It's completely parametric. It's super clean. We can make any kind of modifications we wanted. Oop, caps lock was on apparently. Um... Currently, this is saying, is it dynamic or is it not dynamic? We have an alternative, or maybe it's both. I'm not sure. A thought is, what if it's always dynamic, clear, and instead, the field force is not getting applied until those are activated. So gravity won't fall down. Now, I'm actually not sure how well this will work. It could be weird, but I'm going to try dragging in our MoGraph selection here. And I'm just going to see what happens. They should be dynamic right away. So the hope is that those will get blasted away. Yeah, those get shattered away and everything's going to kind of shatter. But the problem here is that, I mean, it's really cool. And if you're doing slow motion, this is totally the way I would do it. You just let those shatter do their thing and it's kind of drifting away. And then you could cut to a different shot and activate gravity or something. So that's a very simple thing you could do. So this is not triggering dynamics. They're all dynamic right away. All the pieces get pushed away. Um, now, because they're always dynamic, it, this is just about if gravity is hitting them. Now, gravity will be hitting those, I think. I think these will, yeah, you see gravity is taking over and they're bouncing off the ground over there. But these, they never got to grow and get hit by it, which is a kind of an interesting phenomenon that we've got going on here. They can't grow and hit these other parts of the glass to kind of get infected because it's based off of, it's based off of the proximity to a piece that had gotten hit and they're outside of that proximity 
So what does that mean? Well, um, I can think of ways of doing it. I'm trying to think of what the best way to do it would be because we have a lot of options here. I do really like that. Uh, I thought would be, because they do react really quickly. So some of this just goes to like maybe fixing these. I don't really like that method because it's a little clunky. I haven't done it in a while. Uh, I have several different thoughts, but inside of the fracture, we do have connectors and we can create a fixed connector and it's automatically connecting all of these to each other. And you see, we've got this one connector and it's automatically connecting every piece to every other piece that's nearby it. And that should mean that these are, you see it becomes a single unit, which is pretty cool. And on top of it, it has a breaking force and a torque break. So as these get knocked out of their way, that is suddenly increasing. And you see the rest of it's being held together. The problem is that they're, they're still technically moving. It's gonna be, I'm gonna try and catch a frame, but you can see here, look how there's like a little bit of a gap in some of these sections. They're still flexing, they're still broken. And if this is a pre-shattered piece of glass, then it's going to definitely show up. Now I did make a tutorial at one point about hiding these in-betweens. I am not gonna cover that in here because I don't specifically recall. And I did make a tutorial back when I was at GSG about doing that. So I'm not worried about that, but there's another option. Another, another option, I guess I'll save this one. Let's not make a connector, so we'll clear that out. And currently it's spreading based on where the gravity should be, based on them finding each other. But what if we made it reference like a, a separate thing? Make a plane, lay this flat in the exact same location, and it's fine it being a little bit bigger so we can see it, but we'll do that. And I'm going to temporarily turn off our fracture. And let's just look at this plane. I want a couple extra points. I'm not sure how many. Let's say 50 by 50, which is probably quite a bit. But you can now see we've got this nice grid creating a vertex map on here. Let me say set. And essentially feed the same rules in again. If, in fact, why don't we just steal it from here? This is all that we need. So... Uh, um, copy, go into the, this, turn on fields, delete, right click, paste. So as this bullet passes through, we should get that and it's going to grow. Now this is static. It's not going anywhere. So we can hide that and inside of our fracture, which we'll turn back on, instead of feeding the weight map in as the source, we can feed in this vertex map as the source and vertex maps travel between objects. So as that bullet hits it, Hopefully, oh yeah, you can see these pieces are still getting the growth. Yeah, there we go. The growth is still spreading out. So the gravity can slowly reactivate on there as those, as those pieces fall away. Now, this isn't perfect. Like there is a little bit of like kind of some floating drifting here, but I, I do like this transition where they can kind of grow and then fall away. And gravity takes over and they're still, it's still remembering the effect. Like once it's turned on, it's on. So eventually all the pieces do fall down. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any, any way of stopping them from moving. I mean, I guess we could just turn, we can make them not dynamic right away. That's a little maybe dangerous. What I'm thinking is, if they're not, dynamic we're kind of feeding these systems into a lot and i think we've covered the topic well enough i don't feel the need that we really have to continue but i was thinking about like these all start drifting right away so like immediately those kind of push away what well, if we didn't want that to happen but we still want that growth and gravity to happen while this initial part shatters i, I that could be a little bit of a tall order i like the idea so we'll spend a little bit of time on it but um and I'll save this as another version because that one was also working quite well. Okay, what are we doing this time? Well, I'm gonna make a second vertex map and this one is essentially the exact same idea, but I wanna feed it a different object. So it's kind of activating earlier. So instead of being a capsule, I'll make a spherical field and it can be, I don't want it to be super big, but bigger than this. So it's a little bit bigger than what we're seeing. 
that is what's going to get fed in as the uh, initial input on that one. Let's take a look at it again. So we have two different vertex maps. This is what this one is doing. So this one should activate a little bit sooner. Hopefully, um, maybe not soon enough because you see it's not showing up right away. It does eventually. That's actually quite a bit of delay. I'm not sure what accounts for that. You could rearrange the order a little bit, but uh, I don't know that that is what I want. So uh, as a way of maybe brute forcing it, if I increase our spherical field, why is that? Uh, that does not seem right. I turn off the freeze for a moment. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Yeah, well, that's bizarre. I'm going to delete the spherical field. Drag it in. I mean, I guess it's it's riding on a dynamic object. Does that make it like lag a frame behind? I'm kind of feeling like it does. Wait, that's not even growing. This is distinctly inside of the spherical field. I'm going to pull it out of the spherical field and move it around. That's, oh, is it that same refresh issue I was running into the other day? And that spherical field is full power. Why would that fade out? Oh, yeah. I think I found a new bug the other day, which is not a good thing. But it was something where, like, two, if there's two different vertex maps on one object, which is one of my favorite workflows, one of the other ones won't refresh because the other one exists. So not helpful. I'm going to actually kill off that original one. And let's just, yeah, instantly it starts working. So there's currently a bug. Um there's currently a bug in cinema that it doesn't like two different vertex maps on one object and it, because the second one won't refresh. So it's not seeing that, which is a giant pain. And this is new. This is the updated version, so it was not fixed. So it's a little frustrating. Currently, the only workaround that I have found is actually just to duplicate the entire object, which is terrible. That's a terrible workflow because now we've doubled the geometry. But now, well, anyway, now you can see that that will strike and it is accurately applying it in which case we can begin the growth process so that can hit and then grow from there. So that the idea being that will trigger, uh, that's going to trigger the actual dynamics, which is not something we're actively controlling right now. So instead of it looking at that variable tag, the dynamics will be driven by this vertex map. And that is what is dynamic. So let's say those are now enabled so hopefully if this is working those suddenly became dynamic and they can be struck so the point of this is you can see immediately that these outer ones are not being immediately affected which is nice the spherical field is large probably larger than it needs to be i'm going to shrink it and let's let this crash through and now immediately these can fall away but not everything falls away and then it grows so we don't get that expanded shattering effect and then they all fall away yeah so that's pretty much what i wanted it to do i guess it wasn't as tricky as i thought it would. actually well it's not doing that initial collision it's not seeing those is it just not far enough ahead the spherical field might be small enough that it needs to lead the bullet a little bit so it can activate it to do the initial punch Yeah, there, now it's actually pushing them. So it, it just needed to lead it to have that one frame to trigger it so it could shatter and then the growth can happen and all the pieces fall away. So it's kind of a stylistic choice of which one you want to, which one you want it to do. So yeah, that will cover that. Um, this ver double vertex bug is, just, oh man, I gotta, I gotta talk to Maxon about it. It's driving me crazy. Double vertex map bug note inside of my notes okie dokie back to the chat um trigger on collision uh somebody's asking about trigger on collision is a thing the problem is let's see if the setup can account for it i'm gonna turn this off oh, and now it's all on it's all immediate and if we let it crash through it's going to shatter right away and i think the gravity is still turning on based on this MoGraph selection and the MoGraph selection is still doing its own capsule. So that still grows. So you see it immediately can fall away. We could just say it has gravity all the time. 
But actually, we don't need to do that because it won't be dynamic. I'm going to say, let's get rid of the fall off, the limitation in the fall off. And inside of the Hironoi fracture, you're saying, what about the trigger on collision? Um, I'm actually curious if this works because if it does, it's, it's a valid technique. But here's what I think the limitation is. I'm going to go to trigger and say on collision. And as we frame forward, yeah, well, I, yeah, look at what it, it definitely behaved a little bit weird there. You can see how those do fall away. The problem with that technique and the reason why I didn't want to do it that way is the when it immediately gets collided with, actually, it's being super weird there. I might have, there, there might be a combination. We've been playing with a lot of settings here, but do you see how it gets hit and pushed away? But a lot of them are not fully collided with yet. So it, it can't figure out the dynamics. They kind of need to be dynamic before they were hit, but they're not dynamic yet because they're waiting for the collision. So it's kind of like the, it's, it can't simultaneously be collided. You see it creates a trigger and they fall away, but it doesn't punch them away. That's why I didn't do that technique. Uh, even though we do get that little splash initially, which is interesting, but that is my thought. I already knew that was a limitation. I should have mentioned it, and that's why I wasn't doing it, but that's a thing. Um, I don't, uh, chop, I don't know what you mean. Field forth with fall off. That's, no, I need context for that. Argo was asking about VDB morphing between animated objects. Uh, is that kind of an extension of what we were talking about last week? I need more of a context. There's a, just a heads up for everyone asking questions. Make sure you ask it as a fairly detailed question. If it's too, like, can you field force with a fall off? I lose the context. I'm not sure what you're talking about. So a more complete sentence is helpful. Um, let's see. Voidium. Is that a question for me? Oh, geez. <laughs> the Voidium is asking a question about having a ragdoll figure that's doing a walking motion, gets hit by a dynamic ball, reacts to that, and then uh, con um, and then continues walking. That is some advanced AI research type of stuff. It's not to say that there aren't some things we could explore with it, but that's that's like hours and hours and hours of research and definitely not something that can be done on a live stream like this. It's a fine question. It's a fun it's a fun sort of thing. And when, uh, first of all, if you haven't seen my ragdoll tutorial, that's worth pulling up here. Uh, let's see. I think, well, I'm not sure where Maxon put it. Um, like, university, are they, do they have uh, the videos on here? Um, videos. Ragdoll. I'm not sure how far back it goes. Yeah, I think that they don't post the presentations here. Those go on the official website, I think. I don't know. Let me search. Ragdoll. Yeah, there's not. it's not on Cineversity. So I, it's going to be more complicated to track down. Uh, but I did a really, really fun Ragdoll tutorial about making ragdolls, but that is going too far here. Oh, it's in the Maxon channel. Thank you, everybody. So YouTube. Maxon. And if we go to videos, it's probably, I mean, they, they post pretty often, but it shouldn't be too far back. Um, search ragdoll. There it is. Ha ha ha. So I'll put this link in. So you see right in the beginning, um, these are all ragdolled up characters. Rag. And being able to do stuff with them is really fun. And I, I, <laughs> I did a bunch of like, as, like essentially, like a parametric animation on them to make them do this crazy intentional over the top run. So, yeah, a lot of fun to be had with ragdolls. As far as transitioning between, I had some ideas with it on the character, but man, that's going to be a, an undertaking. So I'll post the link there for anyone who's interested, but 
I re it's one of my favorite presentations I ever did, so I'll definitely go check it out. Um, let's see. Uh, Gazox, did I ever try Houdini? I did try Houdini for a long weekend. I thought it was really cool. Um, I could see how it worked. I was immediately doing some fairly advanced things, like you know some dynamics things and some particles and going as crazy as I could. It just goes, I don't know. I just Right now, for what I'm doing and for what I like teaching or for what I like making tools for, Cinema 4D is where I want to be. Uh, Travis, ah, this is one that we were chatting about in the Slack channel, and it was pretty neat, and I said it would be really cool to tackle. So here it is. It's from the Evolution of Sleep from, oh, of course, Zachary Corzine. Oh, this is, uh, this, um, so we got Zachary, look at this all-star cast. We got Zachary Corzine, Aaron Covret, and Andrew Prosales, and probably more. Yeah, Jeff Thompson, Trevor Kerr. Oh my God, I know most of these people and they're all amazing at what they do. So yeah, here's specifically what it is. So, um, and, this was the specific effect that we want to take a look at. You see how it's this new like kind of memory foam mattress and you get this really nice bunching up of these different pieces. And the question is, how do we get this sort of fun deformation and layering? So let's see if we can make that. Thanks for checking the link, by the way. Very handy. New file. Um, we could run into limitations here. I don't have this fully in my head. But how many units do we want? I'm going to keep it relatively low. In fact, this is probably a good count. So make that editable. Select all of our edges and hit D for extrude. I'm going to do an extrusion of zero. Hit apply. And now I can pull this straight up into the air. Holding down shift, I'll drag it, drag it up exact, exactly 50 units. So we've extruded edges. And uh, that is excellent. Actually, before we do that... I'm going to undo, select all my points. Actually, I have to be careful. Let's undo a couple extra times. Make it editable. Select all. Those are those points. I'm going to try creating a selection tag that might save us later. And I don't know if this is a good idea either, but I'm going to select all the edges and also create a selection tag. So we have the original points as selections. Now, D for extrude. Do an extrusion of zero. Pull that up 50 units. We need to delete the original polygons. You can't easily select them. What we could do is we have these edges currently selected. So if I hold down shift, I can convert these to polygons and hit UI and invert my selection. And now I have the bottom and those bottom ones are there. So I can hit delete. And we are left with just all of these edges. Now we got to be careful. These are non-manifold polygons. Their orientations are not super... It can get weird. I guess is the is, is a point here. Uh, I'm going to double check my selection tags and they don't seem to have transferred in. Unfortunately, it would have been good, really good if they could have. They didn't. What I want to do is select all of my... I want, I want to be able to distinguish between the top edges and these vertical edges. The easiest way to do that, since it didn't work, would be to do a rectangle selection from the side view, a tolerant selection, in fact, and do that. And now I've got every edge selected. I'll override the current selection there. And then let's hit UI and invert. And now we get all of those edges. And I'm going to deselect that tag so it doesn't get overridden and create a second selection tag. We might need those. We might not. I am not certain. All right. Now, let's just see if we can throw soft bodies at this and see if it works. In fact, I'm going to make a duplicate of that object in case we need to come back to it because I want to make a bunch of subdivisions here. So if I hit MF with these current edges selected, I can say to M, F, yeah, edge cut, hit apply. You can see I get a vertical cut right down the middle. So we get that nice extra segment. So I can increase that to a couple. I don't know, I want to keep it pretty low poly, but not, I, I want it to be able to bend a little bit. Now this is a live stream, so I'm going to drop it down not too many. So we'll do three subdivisions. And let's make sure that our selection tags continue. Yeah, excellent. You see, my original selection tag still remembers the original corner, so I don't get all these extra ones. That's pretty useful. So let's see if we can just throw soft bodies at this thing and if it works. So simulation, soft body, and create a floor. The floor is already right there, but I'll let it drop a little bit. And let's make that dynamic as well. And that wonderful mattress foam look, but we don't want to be the same, so ours will be pink. Now it's totally different. 
So let's just hit, well, we'll never just hit play with a mystery dynamic object. And because these are non-manifold, let's just hit frame. Okay, I did a couple frames. You see it's playing back fine. So I feel safe to hit play. And then, okay, it's it's falling. Now you look, you can look and it is soft body. This is a soft body object. So that's actually working incredibly stably if that is indeed working. Now in the reference, it's getting like folded over and squished. Uh, I'm not sure what the best way to go about doing that would be, but there's definitely kind of a tilt up and squish. So um, for my money, I'm thinking, what if we I can create a null, put the floor in the null and let's keyframe this floor to tilt over what axis and get R spin it a little bit like that. And we can see that this is on the V axis. So at the time of zero, I will make that be zero and hit play and around, let's give it some time. Let's say around frame 45, that will be bent in not too much. Let's go 12 degrees. So that should actually keyframe and tilt over, which is fine. We can actually see these bending a little bit. Now, if we copy and paste that null that I made, copy paste, we should be able to spin the null 180 degrees. And now we have two floors. And what's cool about being able to spin that is I didn't have to re keyframe. And now we have two different floors and they'll both tilt up a different way, thus forcing this inner part to compress. Okay, excellent. Uh, looking good. Uh, give ourselves a few extra frames and we'll save this. It's going well. Or I'm not sure what to call this, so we'll just go with the mattress. Okay, this is working quite quite nicely. Uh, I'm going to get rid of all the friction, especially on the floor, so that these are more free to slide. I'm not sure how low I should go. I'm going to drop it to five, which is a big drop. But let's see if these start sliding in and how much their internal structure can support them. So you can see these start falling in and compressing. It's actually working surprisingly well. Yeah, that's actually working nicely. Uh, now, they are going to start bumping into each other quite a bit. There is no thickness on this. And to add thickness would be, it would slow everything down and compress in ways I don't want it to. So I want to keep these really thin. I don't know if this is a good idea, but... I want to give it a size increment that's larger. I can never remember which one it's going to be. Or at the situations, it's not that I don't know when it is. It's I don't know the circumstances in which one is better than the other. What I'm getting at is one of these little planks, these vertical planks, is 10 at its longest point. So let's try giving this a margin of 10 and see if it explodes. It may or may not. Yep, you see it immediately. I did one frame because I wasn't sure it was going to happen. Everything starts exploding outward. That's because we gave it a, the margin is the correct setting that we want, but the margin is too big. So I'm going to cut that in half. And that, I think, will look like nothing happened. Yeah, cool. So now, hopefully, there's sort of an invisible force field around every one of these walls with a radius of five, which hopefully means, I mean, it's going to float off the ground a little bit. We can sort of ignore that. The hope here is that when these start collapsing in on each other, that they they leave some space in between. Uh, it's hard to tell, but it seems to be working right now. It's definitely calculating slower with that being a thing. Or it must just be more complex calculations that it needs to do. But that is doing a fine job there. And we haven't even, like, these are almost entirely default settings right now. If we go under soft body, we've got really strong structure, which is probably a good idea. We want strong structure. Shear is how much it can tilt over. I actually don't want it to tilt over. I might crank that up higher. Flexion, however, uh, flexion's a good thing. We like flexion. I'm going to lower flexion. So it's more likely to bend in the proper direction and not tilt over. So a lot of collisions happening right now. A lot of margins fighting each other. But the hope is these can fold over a little bit better. And the friction isn't fighting too much. There's a little bit of a vibration getting introduced. This really strong shear could be a bad idea. I'm gonna drop it down to 100. Yeah, immediately that calmed it down. If these numbers get too high, it doesn't like it. So everything's sliding more. It's more free to bend because of the flexion, but you see nothing is quite layering up and bouncing into each other. So that is a good thing. Having said that, you know, we did the maximum is five. That's the biggest number we can put in there, but it doesn't have to be five. So we can, we can shrink that down and they can get close to each other, but they shouldn't ever pass through each other. That's the hope. 
And yeah, they're moving a lot quicker and smoother now. And actually, we're getting really nice compression in the middle. Potentially, we could add more stiffness and force these around. But right now, we're just letting gravity do a lot of the work for us. So if that indeed is working the way we want it to, and I think it's looking pretty good, let's try and make this look, this geometry look a little bit more like what we were seeing in the reference. And I think if this works, uh, actually, this is all working well. I'll just save over the existing one. Uh, I'm going to try just putting this into a volume to give it thickness because everything else, if we extrude it, it's going to extrude in both directions and it's going to dynamically be seeing that. So the thought is go to make a volume builder and a volume mesher. Put the mattress into the builder and then you're going to see it's going to create a bunch of geometry put that immediately into the measure and we can see what the final is it does not have enough resolution currently so we'll decrease our voxel size and then okay it's now it seems to have enough resolution you would think it would i can even drop this really small you can see you would think it would but there's no thickness to it whatsoever it can't see it um so let's drop the or jump it back up to five which seems like a decent poly count and try inflating this a little bit so i'm gonna create a dilate and a road and instantly we're seeing it's got really nice volume to it. And that's because this is essentially inflating that really invisible flat polygon out five. But we can just, oh, there we go. Wow, that's working great. We can put an offset in there of two, and that is giving us really nice thickness there. Let's make that the pink object. And, and we want to make sure that they maintain a certain distance from each other. Otherwise, they'll blob into each other. But let's see what this does for us right now. Okay, it's, it's a little melty looking, so I think it needs to be thicker still. Uh, or we can increase our resolution. Yeah, you see that creates it better. We can inflate it still a little bit more. And as we do, I think that'll become more and more stable. And it's really melty. Maybe this isn't, maybe it's not the way to go. I'm not sure yet. Oh, yeah, it's, oh I don't know. Well, it's not what I was going for, but it looks cool. Look how melty it is. Um, let's see if there's anything to be done to fix that because it needs a certain amount of thickness, otherwise we don't see it. But I guess we have to keep on shrinking this voxel size in order to see the individual parts. Yeah, as we shrink it, this is actually getting its integrity a little bit better, but we're starting to create a lot of polygons. Um, and we still gotta be careful about these folds. If they get too close, they're gonna melt into each other. So this is kind of a fun organic looking thing. I'm not sure how, our playback's actually not horrible. The volumes are always impressive with the way they can calculate, but these are, they're doing a fine job of shrinking in and it looks kind of weird and organic we could increase the radius to make sure they don't they don't blob into each other too much um in the dynamics uh just for fun i'm gonna jump back back to five and see if it's enough to keep it a little bit more stable if it doesn't if this doesn't work with volumes i'm not sure what my go-to would be to create the thickness on these Yeah, it looks pretty good. And it, they can't get as close to each other, so they're not getting blobbed. Of course, it's still, it's pretty rough. And I don't, this isn't good geometry, all things considered. I'm trying to think of another good way of creating what I would consider better final geometry. Um, but it's doing an all right job. It's not amazing, but it's all right. Uh, and the essence of the idea is there, and you get this compression in the middle. We didn't push it too far, but if these, if we, a thought had been, I don't know, I don't kind of want, I kind of don't want to do it because I don't think it's worth the time, but we could add a lot of stiffness to the structure through the soft body and then force, like put like a, a box here and push it and push it on the edge and eventually be forced to crumple in the middle. And then these edges would be, you know, seem less floppy. Uh, I don't. Where we're at, I don't think that's a necessary step. Uh, another thing I wanted to do was just because we can see it here in the reference, you see how these center points have more structure. There's like a cylindrical shape in the middle. So let's try and emulate that. And we actually, I was accounting for that already by creating a cloner, a cylinder, a cylinder with a height of 50. I want to clone this cylinder onto this object object that will be the mattress and you're gonna see it's gonna create a bunch of copies i'm gonna say no 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 no. i want to be on the edge it's gonna create a lot of them and it's really big right now so we can shrink the radius down to let's say five so you can see this making tons of them but let's say i want these to be limited to the edge that we saved 
look at that. So now they're on the edge. Uh, we could say scale on edge are actually exactly already the proper size. So they're already getting cloned on there. So without even the volume being there, uh, these will have that one frame of lag behind, but I think it'll still render properly. And maybe if I fix the order, but you can see now that we get the cylinder in the center point of each of those, and it's just moving with it. So if we were going back into our volume, we should be able to just drag in the cylinder as a volume as well. And that should just appear in that point. If we set the radius properly there, you can see we get these little individual cylinders. Um, probably move it below so it inflates with it. There we go. Look at that. So we can get the cylinders cloned on there and get a little bit more structure. So that's working quite nicely. Um, I'm trying to think of other methodologies, um, specifically this volume builder and measure. It's a, it's, I'm glad we tested it. It's a fun direction to pursue it, but is there a better way? I'm not sure. Let me think. Um, Think, think, think. If we didn't want the volume, we want we wanted these to be more of a, you know, it, well, let's just say that these are the final geometry. The sub, these will not, first of all, these will not subdivide very well. Let me just show you. They're non-manifold. And essentially, one of the obvious places we'll be able to see that as a problem is if we put that into a subdivision surface, it's going to, actually, I'm kind of surprised. It's uh, seeming to deal with it pretty well. Maybe it's just randomly the way they connected, but uh, yeah, subdivision surface is actually kind of working. Here, I mean, okay, well, I'm, I don't know how good that will work, but let's see if uh, subdivision surface is working well. Actually, it seems to be working quite well. I'm surprised. I didn't think it would work that way, but if we show our, I can hit uh, N, B, you see it is actually subdividing and it. it is smoothing it out. So that's better than I thought it would do. Um. Yeah, I'm actually really surprised. Cool. So that actually is just a distinct improvement there. We're still running on the low poly mesh, but we can smooth it out. So that is nice. Now we could just give it generic thickness via something like a cloth, but there is inherent problems with that. As I increase this, you're going to see that the, the offsets are very much in one direction. So as if I push this too far, you can see the problem. You see how these boxes are nowhere near even? Like there's the smallest one. And look at these giant ones over here. It's just because the normal direction are the normal directions are all over the place as far as the way those are laid out. And also just the overall thickness of these is not representative of, uh, I mean, obviously if we drop it down, it's less obvious, but you can still see that one's smaller and these are bigger. And we also get the problem that I'll hit play, but and once again, you know, if you, if you had to, this is a fine way of getting a little bit from it. And, you know, it's looking pretty good, but like, I don't like those imperfections. Uh, one thought, no, this is a terrible idea. Well, if we made a, can we make an instance of it? That seems a terrible idea. If we, I can make an instance of, this is a terrible idea. If I make an instance of a subdivision surface, does that instance update? Well, surprisingly, it seems to. So here's a, I don't know if this will work, but the thought is, what well, if we make a second we're trying to do this the dumb way. If we were to make a second subdivision surface here and throw it in and push it the opposite direction, so do a thickness of negative five, that should sort of be the opposite. And now if we look at both of them at the same time, the combination of those two sort of does the same thing. So now we can cut the thickness maybe in half, about half. So now it's actually pushing in both directions. So that forces them to even out no matter what direction because we're pushing on both. Um, the, they, they're not technically the same object. They're separate, but if they kind of exist in the same spots, then maybe it works. Uh, it's working better than it has any right to because we are extruding in both directions. Uh, and then the uh, cloner actually should just continue working. So just turn on this cloner and those will still be following the original object. Do that. Yeah, look at that. That is uh, surprisingly good. I'm actually kind of shocked that the instance is working there to create an exact copy of it. And we can do that. Um, to, if we if you subdivision surface this, it wouldn't work. Those are two separate meshes. That could be bad. But as far as just throwing, just throwing the simulation at it and letting this do its thing, that is surprisingly good.
surprisingly good. Um, I'm going to tilt these a little bit further. Um, I'll go double the distance, which is kind of absurd. I just want to see what it looks like if they really pile up on top of each other. So, yeah, this is going to really squish it in. And they should super slide down and kind of make a mess. But they do still have all that thickness, so I don't think that they will run into each other. Yeah, doing a fine job. And then, just for fun, if we go into soft body and I start giving this some stiffness, is it suddenly going to attempt to spring itself back to life? Yeah, just a little stiffness goes a long way because it's absolute. The stiffness is super absolute, so you can never, you can't, you can't ever use stiffness. It doesn't, it's not uh, relative. I wish it was relative. I wish it just made like hearty individual springs that are like absolute but that's not what it does. Um, yeah, neat. Um, surprisingly good. Like I said, uh, this this technique of doubling them up doesn't doesn't you know we couldn't bevel these because those two edges would bevel where they meet. Um, there's we can't do a netting. Um, is there, could we extrude? That'd be weird. And then they wouldn't be fully dynamic, but they could be half dynamic. That seems like a bad idea though. Um, potentially you can make a really complex rig where everything starts interlocking with everything else. And that could be a thing as well. I mean, this is, this is the quick version. Everything else would be making much more advanced rigs. So I think that this is a good place to leave this one. Um, I, I continue to be impressed at this double cloth surface trick. I do like it. How are we doing on time? We still got a half hour. I'm probably going to have to actually do the two hours today because I have some other things to catch up on. Um, but uh, good question. Do, 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 do. Let's see. Um, that one came from Twitch. I'll check YouTube, but I don't see anything popping up too much. Or how would you do a dynamic soldier? Yeah, like a dog tag. The uh, like the uh, Wolverine like name on the on the uh, tag. Now technically, there's little ball. Yeah, little balls that connect them and cylinders. Um, yeah, so that's coming from Scientist Pack. It's a good question. Um, I actually have the structure of those in my head really well because I I, I'm always fascinated by that type of thing. So the actual structure of those, if we're just going to have a conversation about them, would be something like, this is not going to look amazing, but I'm just going to make this default cylinder editable. And what's a good angle? So essentially what those look like would be I'll just do it on half and it will mirror it. Uh, UL, UF, delete. Grab that, grow. And that, and something like that. So the shape of those is sort of like this. MS. Um. Oh, wait. Uh, well, let me just uh, do the last little bit. I mean, it's silly to do too much of this because I don't think we're going to use this, but I'm on a roll. Bink, bink. Delete those. Okay, so that is essentially the shape of what these end up being. Actually, this hole probably would have to be a little larger than the one on the top. So just as a way of finishing out that. Whee! Uh, T for scale, that can go down a little bit, maybe up a little bit. There we go. So, um, let's mirror that object. Uh, mirror, 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 mirrors in here. Symmetry, not mirror, but that will mirror it. 
Okay, so that is like the base shape inside of it. And what ends up happening is there's also a ball that is essentially the same radius, which can fit inside this hole, but it can't fit out that one. And it's always paired up with an identical one, kind of like that. And in between those would be a cylinder. This is technically the structure of this. So what ends up happening is, I'm not sure what the best hierarchy would be here. I'll just group these. So that ends up doing that essentially, where that can plug in. And this entire structure repeats. And all this without looking at reference. So put that into a cloner. And turn down SSAO. Linear. Give it the proper spacing. Okay, so that is actually what those chains look like. It's this structure, and they look really cool, and they're just fun to play with. So you get that kind of thing. And it's, uh, it's pretty neat. Dynamically making them, that's a bigger question. But um, I mean, honestly, the best way would, well, couple thoughts. Could we just use this structure and run it on a soft body uh, spline? That's a, that seems like a good idea, actually. Let's try that. Um, so here is our, everything's a little big, but there's, let's, mm, it's going to be small with dynamic, so I want it to be pretty accurate. No, you know what, let's do it in real world scale. That's going to be cartoonishly huge. But there is our Wolverine. Put this up, T for scale, scale that down, and that'll become the necklace. Rotate that to an arbitrary angle. Subdivide this quite a bit. I'm not, it's gonna be, it's gonna be large. I'm not gonna subdivide it so many times that uh, we need them to be big, but let's see if the concept works here. So I've got 48 segments. Now there should be a couple hundred probably, but I'm gonna do 48. Uh, I'll make this soft body, make the figure a collider body. Make sure it is a static mesh. Yep. And that should fall. Yeah. <laughs> a little stretchy. We can fix that by giving this a lot more structure and no shear, but more flexion. So it can bend easily. All right. A little bit, a little bit funky there, but that's fine. Now there's a particular radius on that, and that is going to be determined by our uh, collision margin, I believe. If we set that to zero. That's going to, yeah, it's going to immediately fall through the character. Um, but I want to control it myself, and we'll do that via a margin of whatever we want. So a margin of one should be enough to keep that properly there. So now there's essentially, it's a thickness of one. And that's a, we didn't check the numbers, but that should be pretty accurate there. Um, so the simple possible way of doing this would just be cloning onto the spline. So... It's going to be cartoonishly huge right now, but if I hit T for scale and start scaling down, we, um, it's a little, it's a little offset. So maybe the cloner is not going to cooperate. That's uh, unfortunate. Why is the cloner not cloning onto, let's just say onto the edges. It's weird and offset and not following. Uh, is that, is that a problem that we usually have? doesn't seem like it. Um, well, why are these offset in space? Everything's at really clean numbers, zero, zero, zero. Everything's nice and clean. Everything's really small. I might drop our scene scale down to 10 just to make the dynamics a little bit more accurate, but that's going to have no effect on... Actually, it's even less accurate now. Boom. Um, why is that offset? <sighs> Even the curvature doesn't seem, oh, it's like all rotated oddly and whatnot. Um, keep soft body shape. No, um, there's a setting, but I don't know that would fix anything. 
It's like where the axis goes. Dang it. Um, Yeah, sadly, some uh, chop suggested turning off reset coordinates, but that's not doing anything either. Um, I'm not sure what the deal is. Uh, when in doubt, let's try throwing that into a connect object. And a lot, well, the rotation, yeah, see this built-in rotation? I kind of don't like that. So let's zero out that rotation. Or let's keep it even at least. No, no, no. Let's leave it zero and then rotate that to be flat. Okay. So that's connect. Let's clone onto the connect. That's not actually going to disappear because it doesn't acknowledge this cloner as a spline. But if we feed that into a spline mask, it should. Unless it doesn't. Oh, nice. Now it's... Uh, it's lost its mind now. Oh, I th this should have been easier than it was. Uh, Michael, that's not a... Well, I mean, it's kind of a... I don't want to do that, but it could be a good idea. He's suggesting... Well, if soft bodies aren't working for us, then possibly what if we try just, <clears throat> just try throwing a... a um, hair, hair dynamics. So we'll put some spline dynamics on from hair. And... Let's see if that, oh, uh, a couple of things. We need to make it editable. I'll make a copy, make it editable. Of course, it jumps way down there for no particular reason. Oh, my goodness. All right, hang on. Getting a little, a little frustrated with these knots cooperating. It is there. Fine. Good. Make it editable. Okay, it's in that spot. Now that that's in that spot. At a hair spline dynamics. Okay, at least it... Nope, it did jump again. Why is it... It's jumping to a different coordinate system. Down to zero. Now it's up there. I had to reset it. Okay, weird. Uh, and then the figure needs to become a collider. Well, before we even do that, let's just see if we can clone onto the spline. Yeah, it's following that system at least. So, something. Um, and I do like these spline dynamics. They just don't interact with other dynamic settings very well. Um, mm, oh, collider. I was like, what am I doing? Um, sim, no, hair. Collider? Is it going to be as simple as that? Sadly, no. We might need individual. Oh, and it's not resetting. Okay, Cinema's lost its mind. Should be working. I'm in the updated version. Um, so adding the... I was yeah, I didn't think it would necessarily work with the figure, but look, the entire necklace has gone away. These spline dynamics are not resetting at the time of zero. They just keep falling further and further down. That should have nothing to do with the cloner. Everything to do just with itself. Ah, I, I mean, Cinema's not behaving today, so I'm... Now officially putting that on cinema. This is uh, that method should have worked really straightforwardly. Um, having said all that, all of that was sort of the easy method. Well, what is this doing now? Where is my? Uh... Now, I'm... oh, there it sort of is. What? Oh, okay, cool. There's a cloner. It's trying to clone into a spline that doesn't exist. That makes sense, at least. Ultimately, what I actually really wanted to do was uh, make it kind of real with connectors. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time doing every step of the way. But let's try and do just a couple of them for fun. Uh, what's the best way to do this? Um Because we do want these to be dynamic objects, but they 
yeah, we can make these pretty simple. I'm going to throw these into that cylinder, get rid of the null, and now we've got that shape. I'm going to tell both of these to individually be dynamic objects. They'll both be rigid bodies. But I'm going to tell them to calculate as... I'm just going to tell them to calculate as spheres. They calculate way faster than every other type, and the shape should be visually incredibly accurate, and they should run really quickly. Now, both of these objects, I'm going to tell them to be... Uh, compound collision shapes, so they be, kind of become one mesh. And if we hit play right now, it's going to explode. Those pieces will push apart from each other. But if we link them, if we use a connector, and we put a pivot point right here, uh, what type do we want? Maybe, I mean, if we go... I guess a ragdoll could be good. So ragdoll connection right around here. I'm not sure if we're going to aim up or down. I'll say up 90 degrees. Come on. There we go. Uh, it's a little big display-wise, so I'll drop that down to 5. Nope, drop it down to 1. There we go. So you can see that is right around there. Now I eyeballed this. We can keep it actually down below the sphere, just that little bit. It's a good idea. That lives in between those two, and we'll connect A to B, and that should form that connection. And if we hit play, they won't explode. And in fact, they are now dynamically connected, which is good. That at least is working. Back to making uh, the overall figure a dynamic body. That should bounce off of his head. Bunk. And it should be able to bend there. I got to say, maybe I got to do the ragdoll properly. It's aiming up, but I think based on A and B, maybe the order's backwards. I might want this to be negative, like that. Does that behave better? Yes, that is the correct amount. So it can rotate a little bit. Actually, it can rotate a lot, but they're now linked together. So now we can start making... Actually, I guess... No, no, that's the connection. It's A to B... And then that entire thing gets copied again. Now, I'm not going to make that many of this, but something to keep in mind is it's actually not that difficult to make this type of a chain. If I copy and paste, and how far do we need to move it? It would be nice to move it a very even increment. But we can just, you know what? Just to show you that we can be kind of sloppy with it, I'm going to eyeball it. So I've moved up an arbitrary increment. And then we need a connector in between those two sets. So this one can be moved right around there. And we can connect again A to B. Now let's just see if those seem to be working. You never know if they will. Yeah, very nice. So now the reason that this isn't that difficult to make is we can keep on doubling the amount that we have. So by copy and pasting that, we can just move that. And once again, being pretty sloppy with it, just eyeballing it. You can put that right around there. And right in between those is the only one that's missing. Oops, let me make sure I do it correctly right there. So that's in between here and here. So that needs to live right there. And we make the connection between A and B. So now we've doubled that chain and we'll just do this two more times and that should give us a reasonable count. Push this up again. And now, link from there to there. What do we get? Yeah, that's getting to be better. And of course, you get your doubling number. You remember that if you double, uh, like stacks of paper, was it 64 times? You have one sheet of paper, and then two, and then four, and then eight. If you do it 64 times, it would reach the moon. Actually, it might be like bigger than the universe. I'm not sure. Because once you get to those exponential numbers, they get ridiculous. Uh, we want to live in between. Oh, I didn't move everything up. Whoopsie. Oop. It looks like I might have missed one link. One of them looks weird there. I'm worried I missed one. Uh, quite worried. And if it's if one's broken, then I've probably broken it in multiple places. All right. Well. Let's see. 
Bunk, 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 bunk. Oh, they seem to be working. Um, bunk. So let's see. Yeah. I mean, maybe, well, yeah, that one seems weird. So maybe there is a small breaking wall. Of course, I would have copied that problem in twice, but you see how they are behaving like a chain. They are, with the exception of one being pivoting from the wrong spot, uh, which will have been copied twice. You can see that it's actually behaving like a chain. So we can just build the entire thing kind of for real dynamically. And if we use really low poly objects and treat them as like spheres, then I think they'd actually calculate pretty well. Now, is that practical on a... If it's a small detail and a big character, no. If it's a point of your motion graphics piece, then yes, that could be totally a thing. It actually ties in really well with my current, uh, the, the new tutorial that came out with the chain and breaking chains, which I'm trying to do a follow-up on. And it's along those lines as well. Uh, I'm a little frustrated with this entire one because it was a bunch of things that should have worked were not working. So I might do some more exploration there and definitely maybe report some bugs because that one that was definitely doing some things it should not have been doing but it's a different type of chain which is neat uh maybe we got one last one last quick question and yeah a scientist pack check out my chain tutorial where i'm start talking about a lot of these concepts um Let's see what Mick has here. Create a rig like this. Horse. What do we got here? <laughs> I like it already. This is from AJ Jeffries. Blurp. 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 <laughs> this motion is amazing. Blurp. Blurp. Ah, it's adorable. I love it. Um. <laughs> wow. Um, I'm digging it overall. This is great. Um, yeah, I'm gonna, I, I gotta watch this with audio on because that seems really cool. I like it. Um, so how would I rig it? Like volumes or bools? Um, how would you do narrow areas like the mouth? Mm, narrow, well, like if you mean like that narrow areas like the mouth. Um, I mean, off the top of my head, I am kind of feeling like volumes is the way to go on this. But I don't know. It's it's very well done. I, there's not a trivial, easy way of doing this. It is a fully built and realized character. So building in rigs that are able to do more advanced things like that is a big positive. And the way they're blobbing around makes me think hey, they have to be more volume based than anything. And the simple shapes around the surface lend to that. So I'm uh, trying to think of the, I guess, you know, creating a cube. Well, I'm not sure even how far we'll push this. I do, I do like it a lot. It's really, really cute. Um, so, you know, we want to control the roundness of it a lot before we put into the volume. We don't want just to throw a cube into the volume because that's uh, seeding too much of its shape to the volume. So you can imagine building a rig, you know, a blobby shape rig on this. And then I got one specific thing because this, this is kind of the way that both the arms the way I would do both the arms and the neck and everything so oh, I'm trying to think of what I would do here make that 400 tall yeah that's maybe a little too tall 300 so 10 segments on the spline so you get something like that so the thought is converting this character Convert selection to joints. Oop. Um, not selection. Character. Convert. Spline the joints. There we go. I was like, okay, well, that should have worked. So now we get that, you know, sweep of joints. Right click on the top joint. Rigging. IK spline. Drag in the final joint. Drag in the spline it's referencing. 
and that created that entire thing. But honestly, I kind of want to just control this with three points maybe. So I'm going to select that point, that point, and the middle one. Hit UI, invert, delete. So now this only has three points in it. So that means we can say add, 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 and now we get three handles. And I can say create, 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 and we get three nulls. So now what we should have is a joint chain that controls this spline with three controls. That's the idea. If this is working, then what I should be able to do is grab this and pull it. And you can see that this null is now moving that spline wherever I want it to, which is nice. Now changing that spline to something a little goofier, like a B spline might be a good idea because that's gonna make everything nice and smooth and curvy. So you can see I get these nice bendy bits going and those become controls that we can do things with. Now, if we were building a ring, we're not gonna go nuts on this. Uh, I would probably make, hold down shift as I, oop, no, actually I'm gonna hold down alt as I create, ooh, we can even do an all three, grab all three, hold down alt, create three controls, radius is too big, so I shall shrink them. And, you know, these become, you know, controls of some sort. I can move all three up in the air. And the spline will go wherever we tell it to. So we can treat the spline as a spline, meaning it can be put into a sweep. Bloop. And that will also be fed in Ensign with 12 segments. Should be more than enough. T for scale, something like that. And then if I was going, if I was going nuts, I would probably map the scale of these controls to be the scale of what we're feeding in. Eh, is that worth controlling? I mean, possibly. Um, well, just for clarity, just so you can see, I can do this kind of stuff. So we get these kind of bendy limb ideas, pretty straightforward to make. If we go into the sweep, mm, this is maybe silly, but if we go into the sweep, we can create three different handles and create the different scale controls here and make a little bit of espresso. So add an espresso tag. And what I want to control is this sweep. Specifically, what I want to control is the spline. At any given point, you can grab these different controls and control them. What I specifically, specifically want to do is control the height on Y. I don't know if I can drag. Yeah, I can't drag that parameter indirectly, but if we click inside the sweep, I should be able to go to object properties, details, scale, and then you start getting all of these. But it's actually not that crazy. I mean, yeah, it looks like a mess. But if I say here's point one, Y, well, that's what I want, point one Y. And then I want the same thing again, scale, point two Y. And then finally, point three Y. So those are now the heights of each of those. So if I were to drag in my control, what is my current radius here? Uh, it is 60. So I need a range mapper. I search for a range mapper. I want to convert the scale of the radius the radius will be fed into the range mapper and this will convert it to whatever numbers I want. So currently the scale can be anywhere from, I guess we want to go up higher than it currently is. So I'm going to say anywhere from one to 100 and that will convert to a percentage, which will be zero to 100%. So that should be all we need to do with that. And if I drag in, I'm going to copy this two more times, replace this with the second control and replace that with the third control and drag each of these into the spline control. I don't know if this will work too well, but as I, okay, they're backwards. I got to rearrange them. So that's the top and that's the bottom, maybe. That's the top and that's the bottom. Oh, geez, Louise. Uh, okay, I just got to number them. One, two three and make sure that we are controlling them properly so that that is correct and that is not correct so two should be the middle and it is two maybe uh maybe i'm just not understanding the order here i'm just gonna guess 
Nope, that's bottom again. Oh, geez, Louise. Uh, this one's on me. Um, I'm just, that seems like it should make sense to me. I thought that wouldn't be too complex. That's, you know, we got the heights are being controlled. You can see that my points are going to snap to a given height because we are controlling them. And all the range mappers should be doing that same radius. But why? Um, I'm going to temporarily disable the Expresso back to the sweep and the first point which you would think would be point 0.1. Does it tell us? I mean, that'd be point... Oh. Um, this actually, it is it is not arbitrary because this was point 0.1, that was point 0.2, and that's the third point I made. They're probably made in the order that they go. So this one um, is point 0.1, and that should be controlled by whatever the bottom spline is. So point one should be controlled by that. Okay, there is a logic to it. I just had to think about it. Um, and then this one is the middle point. And that is indeed the middle point. And it's number three, and it should be controlled by number two. So three should be controlled by two. And that means point three. Make sure that I'm grabbing the proper thing. Pull it up and down. And that's the top. That is point two. Point two should be controlled by point one. That was way too complex. Uh, if I had done that properly, that shouldn't have been anywhere near as complex. And there's other things we could have done to control that. Uh, oh, and I have to reactivate Expresso. Um, but anyway, you can just see how I, now I've now I'm moving not only the position of this but also the scale of it. Um, clamped at 100, we could you know, we can't go above 100 because of uh, the spline doesn't go above that. But you can see how. Uh, it, you know, is a little clunky there. But now that I've got that controlled, you can see how we can very easily make this really fun, cartoony, blobby thing that's very easy to control, like all this extra motion from it. So keep that sort of thing in mind. And now, just having done that, those being the two controls that I'm going to worry about, make a vil uh, volume builder and the mesher one into the other, feed in both of our bits. And that's going to get fed in. Now the actual character is pretty blobby. So putting in a smooth and then pushing that relatively far, like it's kind of as far as we can before it breaks. And we never want it to break. So something like that. But this is where it's important not to let the smoothing completely control the overall character. You want to control it based on the internal. So, you know, this probably would have been controlled with some joints. We can control different sizes and whatnot. And that becomes something very distinct that we control. And the... I put these in the backwards order. Apologies. Still sort of worked. Surprisingly, builder into the mesher. Yep. And builder, mesher, make sure the order is correct. There we go, those blob together now. And as long as that is the correct resolution and smoothing them out. And, and of course we could put a smoothing afterward, which is always something I like doing. So I can make it even smoother after the fact. So you get these really nice blobs, and yeah, and you're still, you know, this is free to be keyframed as just a fun, cute character that you want to do whatever you want with, and we have very direct control. And then, you know, if we're looking at that character, I'm not going to keyframe anything here, but if we were to take all three of these controls and pull them all inside of the surface. It's just going to blob away. And now we just get that. So as long as you leave all these limbs and everything just stored inside of the body of the mesh, they'll just disappear. Um, so yeah, that, that's the advantage of kind of throwing in this bendy, bendy limb type of rig. And, you know, I do like the ability for us to control that i mean there's several different ways i could have done that i mean this could also be i mean i like it being a spline but these could also just be three lofts lofting together there's a it could just be a joint chain but i think this is the one that gives you the most like bendy potential so that's why i went with that um somebody had said like the little detail of the mouth um i'm with you there it does seem like a separate thing that could be complex um, I think if we just are throwing the correct resolution at this volume, then it should just kind of work. Um, in this case, uh, I'm gonna make a capsule and move it over, aim it on Z X, T for scale. As long as this is larger than the mesh count that we're feeding it, I think that we could just bo Boolean that out. 
So throwing in the capsule here as a subtraction, and it should probably be inside of the volume. So now you can see that happens. Now the smoothing, that's actually interesting. Oh, oh, my smoother here is smoothing that out. If I turn off the smoother, you can see it's actually making the mouth pretty well there. Uh, so controlling this via this capsule here, yeah, you know, we can have decent control here. The resolution should be relatively good without us throwing too much at it. We can even push it in. So you can see it's actually doing a pretty good job with that mouth overall. And if you did want it to be smooth, I would let this big one be very smooth. And then the mouth can be involved in a secondary smooth where everything gets smoothed again. We just have the effect happen a lot less. So this can come after the mouth and then a little bit of extra smoothing can happen at that point. So it doesn't get obliterated by the big, oops, looks like I accidentally, oh, you can't, you know, it doesn't, you can't hold down control and get a copy that way. And that's a little bit of a pain. In fact, I don't think you can even copy and paste. I'll just create a new smooth. That'll go there. And this one, like I said, just have this one be pretty mild. So that can also get smoothing, but it's not getting obliterated by this bigger smoothing because it comes from above. So as long as our resolution is good, then we should be able to be like, blah, 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 and let that uh, talk and do whatever motion we want it to do. And if at any given point it's not quite working, then of course you just need to increase your voxel size or shrink your voxel size, in which case that increases resolution. And now you have more direct control over what the mouse shapes are doing. And even my smoothing, which is obliterating the mouth a little bit, if we you know, just use it to a not quite so many iterations, then it can still smooth it, everything out a little bit and add that type of thing in. So I don't think I, I don't think it needs to be overthought. It's just a really well put together character that can be controlled via volumes. What's pretty neat is uh, I don't think you'd have to work in the volumes to be, you know you you can still see these things and know that they're working pretty well and only turn them on at the end when you need to really see it. Um, so there's a, a lot of fun and it's really cute. And it's a way of making it feel, I don't know, it felt CG, but also kind of felt almost like stop motion. But you can even see now that with all those smoothings I'm throwing in, that's really slowing us down a little bit already. So that's fine at render time, but while you're working on it, it'd probably be a good idea to keep these smoothers off. Those are what really slow down the calculation time. I bet that's this is going to be significant. Yeah, look how fast it is now. So smoothers are dangerous there. So even doing the animation here, um, like this and then doing the smoothing after the fact and just making sure that everything looks good and continues to work there would be my workflow. But kind of conceptually, it just kind of opens up the opportunities to do something kind of new and weird. Uh, so I do super applaud it. Uh, and there's so many things, you know, neat details that uh, go along with this. As a super final detail, you could just, you know, if you want to put a, you know, if that's the, an eyeball or something on the creature, I can just put a rigging tag in here, a constraint of a PSR that is going to attempt to match the position of that null. So there's a sphere up there. So that becomes the eyeball. And that can also live inside of here. So it's going to get blobbed in and put it down below that smoothing level. And then those can get smoothed out. And you start, you know, model out the eye, the, uh, the eye, the lid from it, or, you know, create a second object that's also tracking the exact same position that's getting fed in. And I could subtract from it. And if the radius was proper and or offset, then, you know, you could, there's, there's just a lot of layering and fun extra details you can do to make a full on critter here without overthinking it. Like that's just always going to snap to the proper spot. So yeah, kind of weird and neat and there's a lot of potential. Um, yeah, it would make for a really cute kind of uh, short film. Uh, it is a volume critter. Yeah, we need to go deeper on something like that, but for now, I don't think it's a. Uh, it's not worth going super deep on it. Uh hey, Bob's in the house. How's it going? Haven't seen you in a while. Welcome, welcome. Um, unfortunately, you're here at the end, and I am now done because there. You know, I got a bunch of other things. I got to get that tutorial uploaded onto. Yeah, I got to get the tutorial uploaded and finished and get the thumbnails done. There's so much to do. So um, this is going to be the wrap up. Thank you so much, everybody, for the questions. Uh, we're definitely starting to get more people hanging out. So that is fun. Um, quick recap. Uh, I have a Patreon set up so you can get access to the scene files and get access to all these files earlier. There's also two bonus streams, Tuesdays, where I try and record a tutorial 
And Thursdays is just exploring some of these concepts deeper. So when the question comes up again, I understand it better. Um, but, you know, the, the stuff will be out there free for the world as it is. So it's appreciated, but not necessary. Uh, keep an eye out for, well, there's the new chain tutorial, although there's going to be a follow up on it. So maybe wait for that. Uh, another new tutorial I'm really looking forward to next week. Uh, make sure you go and join the Rocket Lasso Slack channel where there's other cool people who are willing to answer questions, help each other out. It's just a cool community of helpful people that are there to improve their skills and help other people. So that is rocketlassoslack.com. Otherwise, that should wrap this up. Uh, thank you so much, everybody. And I will see you in, I guess, in a week, except for people for the bonus stream, which will be tomorrow. So bye-bye, everybody. <laughs> and boop.